Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have been around more than 30 years, and Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's four heroes in a half shell have dominated multiple industries, from comic books to cartoons, toys, video games, and of course movies. The first movie came out in theaters in 1990 and was a smash hit because of how well it blended the dark and gritty tone of the comics with the Turtles' light-hearted personalities of the original cartoon series. The sequel, The Secret of the Ooze, came out the following year in 1991 and was successful in its own right even though it controversially changed things up to become more kid-friendly by abandoning the dark and gritty tone of the original and amping up the comedy. But unfortunately, here we are 30 years later, and none of the films that followed have been able to reproduce the quality of the first two films. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, the 2007 CG animated film TMNT, and the two Michael Bay produced reboot movies all have major issues. But TMNT fans almost universally agree that the third live action sequel is what killed the movie franchise. And I wanted to take a deep dive to compare the film with the core principles of what makes a good sequel, to find out why this movie failed where the previous two films succeeded. The overall goal of a sequel is to respect the original while giving the audience something new. There are a myriad of opinions about what should and shouldn't be done to accomplish that goal, but I think most of them can be boiled down to four main rules, which are identify what worked and build off of it, change the stakes, play with expectations, and add new memorable characters. The Secret of the Ooze wasn't a perfect sequel by any means, but it got more things right than it did wrong. Jim Henson's workshop nailed the look of the turtles on the first film and this look was maintained with the new costumes in The Secret of the Ooze. The technical limitations of the early 90s meant that the filmmakers didn't think it was possible to go with their first intended villain, which was Baxter Stockman and his army of mousers. So they opted to bring back the Shredder, which was a missed opportunity to introduce a new memorable villain from the Turtles' well-established lore. But Kino, Professor Perry, and especially Toka and Rezar were pretty memorable additions in their own right. As I mentioned earlier, The Secret of the Ooze played with audience expectations, for better or for worse, by shifting its tone toward comedy and lightening up the violence. But where The Secret of the Ooze was able to respect the original, while successfully giving the audience something new, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 utterly failed across all categories. Identify what worked and build off of it. The most glaring difference between the first two movies and the third is that the Turtles' costumes had a very different aesthetic because Jim Henson's workshop was no longer involved. The turtles' facial expressions were more cartoonish and robotic looking, and spots were added to their skin that drew attention to their armpits and groin area. The filmmakers chose to build off the kid-friendly humor from The Secret of the Ooze, but went overboard by making the movie feel like it was meant for five-year-olds, with its cartoonish slapstick humor and overindulgent pop culture references. Change the stakes. Instead of rehashing another Stop the Shredder plot, the filmmakers decided to take a risk and change the stakes entirely with a time-traveling rescue mission to bring April back from feudal Japan when she was accidentally sent there by a scepter she found at a flea market. The decision to go in this direction seemed prompted by the popularity of their newest video game Turtles in Time, as well as other popular time travel films of the era, such as the Bill and Ted movies and the Back to the Future trilogy. Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. But shoehorning a time travel plot into the third movie was a huge mistake because the concept was so far removed from the pre-established world of the first two films. Which leads to the next point, play with expectations. There are many ways a sequel can play with the audience's expectations based upon what they've seen before in the previous films. But it was impossible for TMNT 3 to do this in any meaningful way because it was telling a completely different story in a completely different world. New York City was traded for feudal Japan, the crime-fighting turtles weren't fighting crime, and April O'Neil wasn't investigating the exploits of a villain or corrupt organization. Casey Jones returned, even with Elias Codius reprising his role, only to be relegated as a babysitter for Splinter while the turtles were away. Expectations were played with, but only in ways that were upsetting. Add new memorable characters, and frankly, there aren't any. Stuart Wilson's acting talent as Walker was wasted on poor writing. Walker's spy wit was somewhat interesting, but making him a Casey Jones lookalike turned out to be pointless. And the rest of the characters are bland, one-dimensional, or too cartoonish, like Walker's sidekick Niles or the four guards that traded places with the Turtles. With all of these misgivings, it's surprising that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 earned nearly three times its budget at the box office, which just goes to show how powerful Turtle Mania of the 90s was, even during its decline when the third movie was released. 
but the low quality of this film was so shameful that the franchise laid dormant for 14 years before another attempt was made to bring the Turtles back to the big screen. 2007's TMNT and Michael Bay's reboot series had their own issues in trying to revive the franchise, but none of them have failed as miserably as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Click a video on the screen for more Ninja Turtle movie facts right here on Fun Fact Films.